Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. Elizabeth Cobbs is a historian based at Texas A&M who has authored eight books of fiction and nonfiction. She joins us this week to talk about her latest work, Fearless Women, Feminist Patriots from Abigail Adams to Beyonce. In it, she profiles a series of well-known and not-so-well-known women, liberal and conservative, from the revolution to today. Patriots all, she says, who have advanced the status of women in society. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Elizabeth Cobbs, The Nation marks uh, Women's History Month in March, and you have a new book of women's history out called Fearless Women, Feminist Patriots from Abigail Adams to Beyonce. So tell me about this project. Well, Susan, uh, it was just a labor of love. Uh, I didn't really plan on writing this book. I've always written about U.S. foreign relations, so American wars, basically. And then I just, I just realized there's this crazy myth that's grown up on the left as well as on the right about what feminism is. And we feel so divided as a country today. And yet what I realized as I was working on this project is that feminism, it was born in the American Revolution. It has driven our history. It has helped to define us. It has contributed to our economic development, our social development, our political development. And I thought, my gosh, how can we let such an important thing just be bandied about um, and not really understand its history? Well, you uh, say that the word feminism is loaded today, and as well as the word patriotism has become a loaded word in our society. So define each of them as you approach this book. Well, part of the fun of this book is <laughs> anybody I spoke to were like, well, you can't put those two words together because some people hate feminism and then the other people hate patriotism and or they think that these things are somehow in opposition. So feminism is I mean, it's a word that comes from the 1880s, but it really comes from the American Revolution. It's basically the idea that, well, hold on to your hats. All men are created equal. It's just over time, and actually right away, Abigail Adams was one of the people to say, well, wait a minute, aren't women people? Uh, so feminism is essentially the idea that men and women are equally, are entitled to equal dignity, respect, opportunity, you know, all the benefits of, of society. So that's feminism. Patriotism, how I'm using it, I think is the oldest definition of patriotism. It, you know, if you want to pull out your dictionary, it goes back to the 1500s. And it's the idea that you defend the values of your country, that you are a person who is loyal to your country and willing to defend its values. That's it. Reading the book, it really was, and I think you alluded to this in the explanation of it, a real sense of optimism that, uh, and you wrote specifically, this is a quote, Americans are inundated to this day by evidence of the nation's shortcomings, yet it's equally important to be reminded of how we work together to get things right. I, I don't, thank you for reading that because I feel like that can't be overstated. Uh, we have this idea that the world is falling apart. And, and of course there are incredibly critical problems um, that we need to address. But it's also the case that we have addressed extraordinary obstacles in the past and we have overcome them and they have brought us to a point where, Susan, you and I are having this conversation on television, something that couldn't have been imagined 200 years ago when women's rights were more similar in America to what they are today in Afghanistan. Women couldn't go to school, simple stuff. So we have done so many wonderful things. And if we don't have that in mind, we won't have the courage and the commitment and the unity to address problems going forward. The approach you took to this book is, is different. It covers the arc of American history, as you said, from Abigail Adams to today, but it does it by pairing women together. Can you talk about how you did that? Yeah, this was a really fun thing because I think that something that covers such a long period of time can easily bog down into like a list of names and dates and organizations. And, you know, I think that's really boring. Um, I'm also, by the way, it's a total, like a, my other hat as I, I write novels as well. And so I'm very attuned to the idea that we care about things because we care about people. And so what I've done, as you as you point out, is each chapter does two things. First of all, it it talks about a specific right 
that was gained at that period of time. And it gives us a sense of kind of what was the ladder, what were the rungs that American women have climbed that brought us to where we are. But I do it through stories. So each chapter has features, two people, two women. And one is the person who I think of as, you know, the person who thought, well, gosh, you know, this isn't right and, and we should try to change something in particular, like the right to vote, or in case of Abigail Adams, the right to go to school. And so that's my person in each chapter who's the face of that social conscience, if you will. Those women, by the way, who often were, you know, sitting pretty in their own lives. I mean, they were not oppressed in overt ways. They had good lives, you know. And so sometimes it would be tempting to think, well, you know, what's wrong with you? Why, you know, why, why do you care? But they were very socially aware. But the other person is what I always call the kind of why we care person. Like, what was it like to actually live under circumstances where your rights were so severely limited in some important way? And so the secondary person in each chapter is somebody you just you just look at and you think, wow, I, I can't believe she did that. I can't believe she persevered. Um, and then it helps you understand why Americans, men, and women both over time said, you know, there's some things we need to change. So I want to do a few of the early chapters and then uh, fast forward into more present day 20th century history. But you've referenced Abigail Adams, who starts it out, and she's paired, paired with another Abigail, Abigail Bailey. Can, well, first of all, you, uh, you referenced this, but what was life like legally for women at the time of our revolution? Well, if you got married, now, by the way, if you didn't get married, it was a different situation, but almost everyone did. If a woman got married, her legal existence ceased, in effect. I know this sounds so weird. You're like, <laughs> I don't understand. How can a person just disappear? Well, but they did. Um, you were what was known as covered, coverture. A woman's legal existence was covered by her husband. That meant she could not own property. That meant um, she could, you know, her husband could chastise her as the word they use. They could, he could beat her legally if she misbehaved. He could forbid her from going out of the house. Um, he, she had no right to go to school. Uh, high schools, the you know, colonial equivalent of high school was closed to women. Women were not supposed to learn foreign languages. If they wanted to read books, it had to be at this, you know, at the leave of their husbands. So, you know, we tend to romanticize, you know, we think, oh, what it would be like to live back then? Well, I'm telling you, it would not be a lot of fun in some respects. Now, if you had a great husband, no problem. Awesome. You're set. But not everybody was that way. And uh, Abigail Adams, you know, here she was at ground zero of the American Revolution. I mean, the Adams household was really in so many ways, as some historians, historians like Joseph Ellis have established, is really where the American Revolution takes shape intellectually. What are the arguments? And one of the key arguments was always that all men, meaning kings, all men would be tyrants if they could. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And so when men, it was men who first started targeting patriarchy, meaning the idea that one king could, could rule them all, <laughs> one man could rule them all. And it was American revolutionaries who really brought forward that idea and who said, literally, John Locke, patriarchy is, is an argument for slavery. And so Abigail Adams said to her husband, before the Declaration of Independence, Independence Susan, I mean, this is craziness, in May, of 1776, she said to her husband, you know, you need to rewrite the laws. Remember the ladies. Don't make us the vassals of your sex. And she, you know, she pointed out that most men were not like that. Most men were not tyrants, but that the law allowed them to be tyrants. And if they were persuaded to be tyrants, they had complete leave to be them. As so often has happened in society, war changed the status of women. A uh, statistic that you give in this chapter is uh, basic literacy for women shot up to 80% during that period of time. What difference did that make? That's so huge. I mean, think about if you and I couldn't read or write, <clears throat> we wouldn't know 
anything about the world. Everything that we knew about the world would come from word of mouth from somebody who may or may not want to tell us what's going on out in the world. So <clears throat> basic literacy had been achieved for men, white, you know, white men, free men, people who were unenslaved um, early in the 18th century. By the time of the American Revolution, it begins to, you know, creep up for women and finally gets goes from something like 50% to 80%, as you point out, that means that you can start to understand the world around you. And little slips of paper or newspapers that come your way, you can read. And that really changes things for women. They become patriots. There was a book published during this period called The Vindication of the Rights of Women, published in 1792. How significant was it in changing people's thinking? This was the very famous book by Mary Wollstonecraft, who was an, was an English feminist and you know writing in London, uh, died in childbirth soon after, by the way, which is what happened you know to so many women in this time where there was no you know control over reproduction at all, and um, so this book a lot of people tend to think well that's where feminism starts if you are kind of aware of this history, you might think, ah, it starts kind of in England, doesn't it, with Mary Wollstonecraft? But Abigail Adams is raising this issue 16 years earlier. But Wollstonecraft is terribly important. I'm so glad you brought her up because she actually writes a book. It's published in Great Britain to this, you know, you know, surprise. It, it comes, it piggybacks on the French Revolution, which, by the way, was a piggyback on the American Revolution. This is one why, reason why I always sort of trace the genealogy of feminism back worldwide to the American Revolution, because it spreads outward from there. But Wollstonecraft is very important. And again, her emphasis is on education. She says, men are, by keeping us from learning, men are treating us and teaching us basically to follow them around, to be their sycophants, to, um, you know, to be their mistresses, basically. And she says, you know, we deserve better than that. We, we have minds. We should feel, feel the ability to use our mind and not just be, you know, makers of babies and makers of dinner. Mary Wallenstone's books uh, is on some of the lists in the current culture war over books that should not should not or should not be read. How do you th think about that? Oh, my gosh. Well, I learn something new every day. <laughs> so thank you, Susan. I did not realize Mary Wollstonecraft had made it on the books to ban list uh, written in 1792, you know, an outcome basically of the American Revolution. Doesn't that tell you everything? That's why it's so crazy. Our values that go back to the English Revolution, to John Locke. These are precious things that really are under assault today by um, authoritarian uh, people, uh, you know, Xi Jinping, you know, Putin, you know, or Orban and Germany, I mean, pardon me, Hungary have all sort of said democratic values are basically stupid. Um, and that's, you know, by that, that was the argument of of um, Hitler and Mussolini as well. So I did not know this, but um, about Wallstonecraft being on that list, it is essentially an argument for women's education. So today there are people who do believe women should not be educated. We know that in Afghanistan, that right, which was briefly extended during the period of time that the United States was, you know, occupying and, you know, co collaborating with the democratic government of Afghanistan and uh, for a time in occupation, the United States promoted women's education. And was it two months ago, three months ago that the uh, Taliban again said, no, we are shutting high schools to girls. We are shutting universities to women and all of these various occupations. That is, you know, exactly where we were uh, 225 years ago. After Abigail Adams and Abigail Bailey, the next is building on the right to an education is the right to speak, which you uh, look at the period from the turn of the 19th century up until the up until the Civil War. That chapter is Angelina Grimke. The Grimke sisters have gotten a bit of attention in the past couple decades, so her, their story might be better known, along with Harriet, uh, Harriet Jacobs. So um, I'm going to assume that people know a bit about the Grimkes, born into slavery in Charleston and became a very noted abolitionist along with her sister. Uh, but tell me about Harriet Jacobs and why you paired the two together. Harriet Jacobs is really America's 
Anne Frank. Here's a woman who was born into slavery. The Grimke sisters were actually uh, slaveholders, if you will. They, uh, their family had plantations throughout Charleston and they rejected all of their wealth and they went north and had to flee north and became noted abolitionists. Harriet Jacobs is less well known, but she is my, she's my why we care person. She uh, fled the man who you know, purported to own her. She hid in a teeny tiny garret for seven years years. It, it's such a small space that she developed arthritis. She was in her early 20s. She was maybe 20 when she went in, 27, 28 when she came out. And she did it basically to save her children. She knew that uh, this uh, enslaver was basically after her kids. And he just sold them in disgust when, um, you know, when she went into hiding. And she did this because she she wanted to save her children. She wanted to save herself. Uh, and he, she was an example and was the first person to write about the way in which slavery had put this unique burden on women because, first of all, they were sexually uh, assaulted during slavery. And slavery could only be perpetuated. Isn't this a weird way to think of it, Susan? Slavery is only perpetuated in America because of the wombs, the, the uteruses of women. Uh, you could no longer import to use a terrible word in relation to human beings, but you could no longer import slaves from Africa after 1808. By the way, by the signature of Thomas Jefferson, himself a slaveholder. Uh, so the only way to get new slaves was to impregnate American women who were enslaved. And, uh, and Harriet Jacobs was in that terrible, terrible situation. So she then later writes a book about it. She, she escapes with the help of you know, black men and women and white men and women. She she hides with um, white families in the North and, and eventually publishes a book on it. And is the first and only woman we know who has ever written about that experience from a woman's point of view. After the war, how did she live the rest of her life? Well, it was kind of interesting. You know, it was so different from men who were um, liberated from slavery in a sense they take up their lives as if, you know, I mean, obviously with a great burden, I mean, the history itself is a burden, but for women it's a different kind of burden because they're compromised sexually. And we all know the double standard for men and women. Men, women are all <laughs> supposed to be Virgin Marys and men, you know, they could be Rhett Butler, it doesn't matter. You know, they can, you know, uh, have as many uh, partners as, as they want and it doesn't uh, affect their standing. Harriet Jacobs never married. But she was always called Mrs. Jacobs. And after the war, she became a very important um, philanthropist, like, by the way, like Harriet Tubman. She and Harriet Tubman both, after the, after the Civil War, became important philanthropists. She started a school with her daughter. Again, the idea of education being the foundation of our liberty. And, uh, and ran that and did a number of other things up until her death. This is going to be my last uh, of your historic older chapters. R the right to petition the government, 1865 to 1900 is the period of time. Susan B. Anthony paired with Elizabeth Packard. Both of them uh, there ended up in courtrooms over their, their convictions. But what I wanted to ask you about with Susan B. Anthony, you give her major credit for the passage of the 13th Amendment. Tell me why. Again, we have this weird perception that somehow movements for, by people of color have always been separated from feminism. And actually, these two things have always been extraordinarily intertwined. If you wrote a book about abolition and you featured Susan B. Anthony, that would be perfectly reasonable. If you wrote a book about feminism and featured Frederick Douglass, a man, a noted abolitionist, if you fe featured him as a feminist, that would be completely reasonable. So Susan B. Anthony was the primary organizer behind a petition drive to get abolition actually into the American Constitution. I think we all tend to remember Abraham Lincoln and his Emancipation Proclamation, but what's easily forgotten is that that was simply a wartime executive order. It was a wartime directive. It wasn't law. And Congress could have slapped it down. It, it, it meant nothing in a way. I mean, it meant everything, but it also meant nothing in law. So Susan B. Anthony was one of those people who said, along with her, her great collaborator, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we need to get this into the Constitution. And so before anybody else, they come up with this great petition drive. They work with the leading senator, Charles Sumner, 
of Massachusetts, and um, and they get collect 400,000 signatures, which are then taken into the U.S. Senate. And these giant stacks of paper that are two black men draw, you know, bringing in this very ceremonial way. And that's the moment at which Charles Sumner introduces what becomes the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which, of course, is there today, uh, preventing the enslavement of, of other people. What landed Susan B. Anthony in a criminal trial in, on June 17, 1873? Well, so, by the way, this woman is hilarious. <laughs> so I wasn't going to include Susan B. Anthony, of all things, in a book on feminism. I thought, well, she's so obvious, and <clears throat> let me find somebody people don't know as much about. And then I just, you know, I fell in love. She was so funny. So she, at one point, she decides, this is craziness. Women should be able to vote, so I'm going to go vote. And it's part of a actually kind of a nationwide movement to do this. There are a lot of civil disobedience. There are other women who do it as well. So she marches into the registrar of voters. She demands the right to vote in Rochester, New York. She does vote. And um, you know, a couple months later, she's arrested. <clears throat> she's arrested for being a woman because you see, she knew she was a woman. In fact, the prosecutor says, well, did you know you were a woman? which, by the way, in today's transgender controversy, you know, would be a different sort of question. <clears throat> but she says, well, yes, of course, but I, I assumed that women could vote. And so what happens is that she's in this epic courtroom trial in which she's not allowed to speak because women do not sit on juries. And if you're a prisoner up for a federal crime, you are also not allowed to testify. So she's forced to sit and ultimately is sentenced uh, and, you know, convicted for basically being a woman and voting. Elizabeth Packard is the pair in hers, and uh, she was on trial, too, for her sanity. Explain how men, husbands, could use insane asylums when they were unhappy with their marriages in this period of time. At this time, it was very, very easy to commit your wife. Now, an unmarried person or a man did not have the same dynamic, but a husband could freely commit his wife to an insane asylum. Now, by the way, <clears throat> it's an old joke, right? Right? My wife is so crazy. So in this period of time, the law allowed you to take your crazy wife, who might be crazy because she disagreed with you on, you know, something very simple, and to commit her. And this was the fate of Elizabeth Packard, whose husband was a minister, and she, of all things, had a religious disagreement with him. Now, this doesn't seem like much, does it? But it was enough. Uh, and he, he said to the, um, you know, he said, she's never disagreed with me before. She must be insane. So then what begins for her is really the battle of her life. And for three years, she doesn't see her children, the young, youngest of whom, six children, the youngest of whom is 18 months, 18 months old when he commits her to this insane asylum. And so she's my why we care person in this chapter. And of all the great ironies, I, I didn't realize that this was going to happen, that both of the women in this chapter end up literally on trial in courtrooms for their, you know, their freedom. And uh, Elizabeth Packard is, it's a long and crazy, well, speaking of, it's an odd story, crazy story. And it was very fun to tell it, but she really ultimately wins her freedom and becomes an extraordinary advocate on the behalf of the rights of, of um, mental illness, uh, patients who are mentally ill. Um, and one of the, by the way, one of the, one of the beneficiaries of her work, and these are all later called the Packard Laws after her, one of the people who benefits so poignantly is Mary Todd Lincoln, whose husband, of course, is dead but whose son is able to commit her uh, to an insane asylum. And it's because of the Packard laws that she is allowed to uh, freely to receive mail, which mental illness, pa mental patients could previously not do. And as a result of that is able to communicate with her lawyer who does get her out. And so Mary Todd Lincoln, the, you know, the bereaved, I mean, she was, you know, she was disturbed. She was, horrified. She'd lost two children. She lost her husband. And, um, you know, but she's able to live out the rest of her life at home because of Elizabeth Packard. Susan B. Anthony lived into the beginning of the 20th century, but never saw women having the right to vote. What ultimately did tip the scales for passage? Well, it's this interesting story where, you know, here the idea that women should vote is born with 
basically, um, you know, Abigail Adams. She does not advocate for it explicitly, but her husband knows the implication. He warns another man, John Adams does. He says, depend upon it, sir. Women will ask for the vote. Now, John Adams says that before the Declaration of Independence and 150 years before women actually get the vote. And in fact, women in 20 other countries, 20 other countries get it before they do here in the United States where the idea is first hatched. And it's really, um, it's not only the perseverance of suffragists, of course, people who take up the torch from Susan B. Anthony, people like Alice Paul and Cherry Chapman, Carrie Chapman Catt, but it's also because of World War I. <clears throat> and essentially what happens in World War I is the idea of democracy spreads worldwide. Women in Britain, even Germany, our enemy, get the vote before women. And finally, Woodrow Wilson goes to the US Senate and he says, are we the last? to learn the lesson? Will we be the last to take everything that women can give us and say that we still don't see what right that entitles them to? So, you know, Woodrow Wilson has a lot of demerits against his name, but in relation to women's suffrage, he's quite a hero. This uh, chapter is not one of all forward progress because you do make reference to the fact that the abolitionists and the feminists split ultimately over the right to vote uh, being granted to males versus women um, and uh, black males, that is. And then also later on, the feminist movement itself split apart. So uh, and when you're trying to process the forward march of history, how should we think about all that? I think we all know intuitively that progress is not a straight line. And in fact, um, you can lose, you can lose it all. I mean, history offers no guarantees. The Romans invented the recipe for cement and the recipe for cement was lost for a thousand years. So, you know, that's why they called it the dark ages. So we, we must be mindful. We must always be careful to cherish and protect what we have. And yet at the same time, there has been a steady line of progress in American history uh, that has also had reverses. For example, I mean, this <clears throat> terrible, terrible, terrible dark chapter in American history is the chapter of Jim Crow. And Jim Crow, which was the explicit segregation and di disenfranchisement of black men, basically, because only men, uh, black men could vote when black women could not. So that same chapter is being written at, at the very same time that there's tremendous uh, te technological progress in America and the invention of you know, electricity and the telephone and all that, and also the extension of the vote to women. And so it always happens that within political movements, there's a lot of dissension, a lot of um, disagreement about how do we move forward. And I mean, we see that today, of course, and that's one reason why I say it's important to hang on to the values we have in common, knowing that we're always gonna disagree on how our values should be implemented specifically. And there is always gonna be some sliding back. It's just the way it is. History is not a light switch. The light doesn't just go on or off. We're at the halfway point of a conversation with Elizabeth Cobbs, whose new book is titled Fearless Women, Feminist Patriots from Abigail Adams to Beyonce. I'm going to fast forward 60 years and we're now in the video age. So I'm going to mix a little bit of uh, video into our conversation. This is a clip of Martha Cotero. We're going to watch and then you can tell us how she made it into your book. When my mother and I were traveling under very stressful circumstances because my father had left. We arrived in a van in Baja California and that was the first chance that we had to get off the van and take a bath in the ocean. All the women held sheets together to shield the women that were bathing on the beach, you know, so they could bathe comfortably. And I remember I was holding this sheet. I was three years old and I saw myself in the same height as the adult women. And all I'm this little girl holding my end, probably not very well, I'm sure I didn't shield anybody, but I was holding on, I was doing my job. And that's the way I've always seen myself. I don't think I've ever felt, you know, less than equal size to anybody. Elizabeth Cobbs, why it is a Martha Cotera part of your story? Martha Cotera comes in the chapter on what is often called the second wave of feminism. 
And she's my face of feminism. And many people would have thought, well, why not Gloria Steinem or Betty Friedan, <clears throat> somebody who's better well better known. But to me, Martha Quintero, who is, who is an extraordinary political leader in Texas and becomes a nationwide figure for a time, she's she's a person who shows how and why feminism really becomes this American value across different ethnic groups. And at the time that Martha Cotero was first engaged in, in trying to promote the feminist message within the Hispanic community, um, uh, his people of Hispanic heritage only figured in 3% of the American population, 3%. Now today, depending on what state you're in, I mean, that's sometimes above 50%. So she's She's an example of how feminism really is a message that's taken up in all of the American, you know, across the American um, <clears throat> spectrum, if you will, because uh, we tend to think of feminism as this white phenomenon. It, it, it is, but it's also a Hispanic phenomenon, a black phenomenon. Among the indigenous Americans, it's a phenomenon. So she really, uh, as a proponent of that and an important leader, and also kind of the face of feminism among women of color. Why did you stop that time period, the bookmarker, in 1975? <clears throat> well, 1975 is uh, such an interesting turning point. Uh, this is a period of time where just as you get a second wave of feminism, you get the resurgence and the growth of uh, a conservative uh, uh, emphasis in American politics, the, the birth of the far right, not not really the Republic, not even really the Republican right, although ultimately becomes very integrated with the Republican Party. But initially, um, you know, it's people who are pretty much on the uh, on the extreme fringe of the Republican Party and not, you know, certainly not main, not uh, main uh, mainline Republicans. Do you count the person profiled uh, one of two in the next chapter, Phyllis Schlafly, as one of those? I do. <laughs> now, by the way, there you know I have friends and colleagues who are like, "What? How in the world can you count Phyllis Schlafly, who many people think single-handedly uh, killed the Equal Rights Amendment, which was on the cusp of, be of getting into the U.S. Constitution? How could you possibly count her as a feminist?" But it's important to understand that anti-feminism and feminism have been in a dance, going back to Abigail and John Adams, where there are some people who say, well, uh, you know, you already have enough rights and, uh, and don't ask for more. You know, don't be greedy. Don't be don't be pushy. And that's what basically John told Abigail. And that's what Phyllis Schlafly did. But Phyllis Schlafly is quite interesting because she was an absolute game changer in the Republican Party. And she said very explicitly, you know, the men just want us to pour coffee. Yeah, you know, they just want us to do all of the menial work. And, uh, and we don't want that anymore. Women deserve a place in the leadership of the Republican Party. So she did a lot to raise the profile of women within the Republican Party. What's interesting there is that she said, but we don't want anything more. So she said very explicitly, I applaud, she, speaking for her, I applaud the Equal Pay Act of 1963 that John Kennedy signed, which said men and women must be paid the same amount for jobs that are advertised. Um, she said I, she agreed with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 which said that you cannot discriminate on the basis of race, national origin, color, et cetera, and sex. She even agreed <laughs> with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, work. And R Ruth Bader Ginsburg, people know as the Supreme Court Justice, deceased, but she made her name because she was the first person to successfully um, bring uh, a lawsuit on the basis of sex discrimination and have it and have it you know be granted and that was a case that was called Reed versus Reed and the idea was there of all things Susan ba Ruth Bader Ginsburg said women should be able to read a contract as well as a man you don't need a uterus uh, or you you can't if having uterus does not disqualify you from reading a legal contract that was essentially the argument in Reed versus Reed in 1972. So Phyllis Schlafly was on board with everything that had happened up to the point she walked onto the platform. But anything going forward, she was highly suspicious of. So she's both the face of feminism as well as anti-feminism. 
we have a great deal of Phyllis Schlafly in our C-SPAN video library. Uh, she gave us an interview in 2003, and I have a clip about a minute long of, of her talking about uh, how it's possible to win. Rallying the troops in the rotunda of the Illinois State Capitol with my bullhorn, and uh, that's when we brought the crowds in. Uh, that's a wonderful picture. It's about 300 feet high uh, to the rotunda of the Capitol. Uh, people used to say Phyllis would send out her rotunda letters, meet me in the rotunda on Wednesday at 10 o'clock, and we would have a demonstration. But the important thing that, that we, we brought out of it uh, was it created the pro-family movement, which that went, then went on a few years later to elect Ronald Reagan and become a great force in, uh, in politics today. We also taught them that it was possible to win because if you go back to the 1970s, conservatives had a very defeatist attitude and uh, th they didn't think they could win. But we taught them it was possible to win, even though we had Nixon and Ford and, and Carter and, and all the powers that be against us, uh, we could still win. Elizabeth Cobb, you say that, and this is the age before social media, that she had the ability to rally a thousand people in a day. How did she do that? She did it by careful organizing. And, and you note in that clip how she says, Nixon and Ford were against her. In other words, the mainline Republican Party thought that she was an extremist, and 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 she was. Um, but she was very careful organizer, and she, <laughs> I mean, she she rallied the troops, and and she did it partly by saying things like we we are pro family and feminists are anti family, which w was not true at all. Um, you know, I think feminists are you know, can pat themselves on the back for being the first proponents of romantic love in America, really. The idea that women and men should marry for love, not for um, just make mostly financial and social reasons. And uh, of course, you know, that's complicated. Love is always complicated. But uh, so women, feminists have always been very pro-family. You know, how, how can we make it more possible for women to get the support they need to raise children? And how can you know, women br help to bring the income into the family? But she, she, she was very different. And this is now, this is, I thought, was an incredibly interesting difference between Phyllis, Phyllis Schlafly, and the other, and the feminists of the era. Because the feminists of the era were very much taken with this idea of, well, you know, we we should all be equal and we shouldn't have explicit leaders and you know we should be so democratic that everything's by consensus and that was kind of a recipe for disorganization and phyllis was like no 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 <laughs> we will have chairmen she always called them chairmen we will have chairmen of our women's organizations and basically women chairmen um and we will have chairmen and they will you know direct people and we will have our bullhorns and we will show up and she was incredibly successful. I have to share the description you gave of her in your book, The Face of a Madonna and the Instincts of a Ninja. Yeah, that was her. <laughs> that is the fun thing about writing. You know, it's, it's, uh, I do, you know, it's, it's very fun to try to, how do you put your finger on these people? And she was like that. She just, in her prime, she just had this golden hair and, you know, beautiful blue eyes and she, you know, beautiful smile. I mean, she was, in fact, she was a model when, for a brief time when she was a young person. And she just used all that Southern polish and charm. She grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. And, uh, yeah, she used it very effectively. The person paired with her in that chapter is Muriel Siebert. And we once again have a clip of Muriel. Uh, this is from January of 1997. You know, on the New York Stock Exchange, when I bought my seat, yeah, there were some hurdles. Nine out of 10 men that I first asked to sponsor me ran out the door. Uh, I could not get a sponsor from the floor, even though I knew a lot of these people well. So I got two upstairs members, and their sponsorship was as good, although it hurt my pride at the time. Uh, but one governor asked me the day I got the seat, and he said, and how many more are there behind you? Like I was leading a parade. <laughs> well, today, 10 or 12 percent of the members of the Stock Exchange are women. Uh, they're specialist clerks. They're, they're doing a good job down there. Uh, I could say, though, 
For 10 years, I could say 1,365 men and me. So I did not lead a parade. Uh, if I did lead a parade, they were very slow walkers. <laughs> Why is Muriel Siebert in your book? Muriel Siebert was a person who is my Why We Care. She wasn't a person who started out thinking about social issues and, you know, what can I do to improve the status of women? You know, it wasn't, it just wasn't on her plate. She loved, um, she loved numbers and she, and she had to make money. And so she, she kept, she was on Wall Street. And initially in that era in the 1950s, women, if they were on Wall Street, which very, very few of them anyway, that the stocks they were given to sort of monitor were like girly things, things they thought girls would understand, like clothes and food <laughs> and shopping. Uh, so she, but she was very interested in aviation and someone else didn't want it. So she took over a aviation um, and also media, uh, areas that people thought wouldn't ever amount to anything. So she was very far seeing. And I chose her because she was that kind of person who just like didn't understand why just because she was a girl, she be, should be paid one third of the guy sitting at the next desk. It just it just kind of bothered her. It was like a kind of almost like a personal thing. Like, I can't believe you think that way. And so she persevered. And ultimately, she does become the first woman on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and for 10 years, she's the only woman on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, she, by the way, she was kind of funny. She thought, now that I'm here, you know, she always, you know, did everything very tastefully. But she thought, I'm not going to do what women in politics do at that time, which is to dress in very conservative suits and, you know, don't mind me, don't mind me. She was like, I'm going to wear purple pantsuits <laughs> and high heels because I want them to know I'm a woman and I'm here and there will be eventually people behind me, even if they're walking slowly. She created a foundation and one of the emphasis was to teach young women about economics and finance. Uh, is that still in existence today? Do you know, has it been successful? It is. And it's to teach all young people about finance. So I said early in our conversation that women have really been a part of the economic development of America. And that's very, very true for reasons I don't want to go into too deeply into the weeds here. But um, one of them is an example of that is Muriel Siebert. Uh, she felt that Wall Street was too elitist. She didn't understand why anybody couldn't just buy stocks. And that's the way that supposedly in a in democratic capitalism that, you know, people without title or rank or giant wealth should be able to participate. So she was the person who offered the first discount brokerage. Today, everybody does. But in that period of time, she was the first person to take advantage of a new law that came about, which basically said that Wall Street could not set its prices. Now, isn't that crazy? I mean, here people on Wall Street are like, well, you know, that business might fail and this business might fail because that's the American way, free enterprise competition. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're setting their own prices for the cost of buying or trading. And so when that law changed, Muriel Sieber was the first and initially the only person to hop on that because she said, you know, my dad was a dentist and I make more in one day than my father did as a dentist working for a whole year. So she not only brought people, you know, pensioners into the stock market, um, but she also developed a foundation uh, that would teach young people um, in high schools and junior high schools about, you know, what is the stock market? How do you how do you make a budget? How do you balance a checkbook? How do you just do these basic things? Because she thought that financial literacy, you know, Abigail Adams was interested in, you know, literacy, literacy. She but she thought that financial literacy was incredibly important. So as we enter the new millennium, we also move into third wave feminism. You also referenced second wave, the era, era we were just in. Can you explain these various waves of feminism and what defined them? Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think people get a lot of com confusion because what was the first wave then? Because nobody even really talks about that, which would have been the vote. But <clears throat> third wave feminism is really comes about in the 1990s. And if you will, I think third wave feminism is in a way cultural feminism is the idea that this is not about law anymore because the laws have been modified and it's illegal to discriminate. And yet 
we still have these events where you go, I can't believe people still think that way. The first, it first was, um, you know, called that in the 1990s when a young woman was watching the trial. Trial is not the right word, but that's what it felt like. She was watching the hearings uh, of Anita Hill. Anita Hill was a young attorney and law professor who had been sexually harassed by, um, you know, the man who was being up for uh, being considered for the Supreme Court. And it was the FBI who found out that he had, you know, you know, that he had been accused of sexual misconduct. And it was the FBI who said, you know, Professor Hill, would you be willing to testify to this? So she did. She was subpoenaed. She showed up. She did what good law abiding citizens do. And she told the story of sexual harassment. Well, what followed from that was what really, again, felt like almost a trial of Anita Hill. I mean, she was called a slut. She was portrayed as, you know, stupid. Uh, and her word was really, I mean, she was just shamed in front of the American people uh, for just telling the truth. And so a young woman, Rebecca Walker, who was watching that, who was a student at Yale said, I can't believe we're still doing this. How can we not believe a woman who has no no dog in the fight, you know, no reason to get up and say this very embarrassing thing publicly, and uh, and we disbelieve her. So uh, people like Beyonce, of course, become the face of third wave feminism. So explain why Beyonce is not only in, in in the chapter, but she's also in the subtitle of your book. Why was she important to your story? Beyonce you know, wasn't an obvious choice. In fact, there were, there were, you know, several editors I worked with who said, are you sure? Are you like pandering to the multitudes in your title? And I'm, I'm like, you, you misunderstand, you underestimate Beyonce, my friend, if that's what you think. Beyonce represents this generation of younger women who <clears throat> want to make, who say feminism needs to be our life. It needs to be the way we interact with other women. We need to not treat other women as, you know, competitors that we've got to smash our way to the top. We need to treat, we need to require men to treat us as equals, and we need to stand on our own two feet. So in her lyrics from the time she was 14 and 15 years old, uh, Beyonce was writing about such things as financial independence for women, the idea that women should pay their own bills, they should pay their own way, they should not, you know, be depending on men uh, for their survival. Uh, she also has always put forward the notion of what uh, third wave feminists would call body positivity, meaning, you know, having a positive outlook on your body without, you know, micro looking at every feature and saying, well, that's good, but that's terrible. And, you know, Beyonce experiences herself personally. I mean, as a young person, her body on display, that's what entertainers do. And, and it would hurt. And in fact, she has a song that's called Pretty Hurts because people then turn the spotlight on what part of you is not pretty enough. And so the notion that we should be fearless, that we should say, no, this is the way I woke up this way. Now, this is me. And I'm good about I'm good with that. I, I hope you are. And I don't care if you're not. Uh, the other theme of, in addition to independence and body positivity is the idea of equality between men and women. And boy, I'll tell you, um, my hat's off to her, her bravery for outing her own husband. When she got married to Jay-Z, Jay-Z, whose last name is Carter, and a rap star, uh, there were a lot of people who put her down as a result of that. And she did this interesting thing. She had a... Um, she went on a tour that she called the Mrs. Carter's tour. Now, there were a lot of people who were like, well, that's retrograde, you know, <laughs> Mrs. Carter. But the backdrop on that tour said it was the word in huge letters behind her, feminist. And she had an all women band that she put together called the Sugar Mamas. <laughs> and um, so this idea that you can be whatever you want, you wanna be called Mrs. Carter, you wanna take your husband's name, do it, wear it, proud. Uh, and But that doesn't mean you're not a feminist. That means you have choices. And that's what feminism is about, choices. The, the, this chapter is, as you, as you write, different than the others. Instead of pairing one person, Beyonce, with another, 
Uh, this pairs uh, with a number of women, including Gretchen Carlson, who uh, successfully accused Roger Ailes of harassment at, at Fox, uh, and also the hundreds of elite athlete victims of physician Larry Nassar. Um, and uh, we have a clip of a hearing that you reference where a number of these young women athletes testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. This is Simone Biles talking in 2021. I don't want another young gymnast, Olympic athlete, or any individual to experience the horror that I and hundreds of others have endured before, during, and continuing to this day in the week of the Larry Nassar abuse. To be clear, sorry. Take your time. To be clear, I blame Larry Nassar, and I also blame an entire system that enabled and perpetrated his abuse. USA Gymnastics and the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, Committee knew that I was abused by their official team doctor long before I was ever made aware of their knowledge. Elizabeth Cobbs. Well, my book is called Fearless Women, and you just saw one. So, you know, it's it, this is that thing where I think feminists have often been accused of being whiners, you know, making mountains out of molehills, talking about trivial issues. And you can see from Simone Biles, this is a young woman who's willing to stand up in front of literally billions of watchers and execute extraordinary death-defying turns and she's reduced to tears talking about this private experience where one man assaulted not just her, but 500 other young women, basically with other people winking and making no effort to rescue these, these poor young women. So that's what really feminism is about. I mean, women in the last chapter, as we know, it is chapter eight is called the right to safety. And so we've gone from the right to learn, the right to speak, the right to petition, the right to vote, you know, all the way up to the last, the right to safety. And this is the one that we still have not guaranteed to women. And, you know, it, it took one man to harm 500 girls, girls and women. And so why can't we do a better job there? And that's, that's where our work remains. Well, just uh, in addition to that, looking at, for example, the Gretchen Carlson is an example of the Me Too movement, which really was popularized uh, during this period. Do you think that society has changed as a result of the highlight uh, highlights given to these issues by the Me Too movement? Absolutely. I mean, again, change is always a back and forth thing. So one of the things that was discovered during the Me Too movement is that every state in the union had taken the rape evidentiary kits that victims of horrific abuse had allowed you know forensic nurses and doctors to collect they took all that evidence and they put it on shelves shelves where it collected dust for 30 years 30 40 years and so what's happening now is we're going through those rape kits. Of course, now, by the way, some of the victims and some of the perpetrators are undoubtedly dead, but we're solving old crimes. And so I think that we do see progress. There is less the kind of automatic assumption and even joke about the casting couch in Hollywood, like, you know, it happens, boys will be boys. So that kind of dialogue has really changed. And it's hard, by the way, it's hard and it's messy change always is, um, that's how you get change. You know, you, you have to go forward, remodeling. If you've ever remodeled a home, you know it's not easy. <laughs> but, uh, but it's incredibly important because of all our rights, Susan, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the right to life, to not be killed, is the most fundamental of all. And our government has not done a good job 
of protecting women's lives. And we're we're still pretty far away from doing that. CDC, by the way, um, a couple of weeks ago, published its annual survey of statistics, including rape statistics and assault of children, sexual assault of children. And, and we found that that number has not budged in 30 or 40 years. The, num- the incidence of child sexual assault has not diminished. We have about four minutes left in the epilogue. You explain that this book is very important to you personally and that you feel that feminism saved you. Can you tell us a bit of that story as we close out here? Absolutely. Um, I came to feminism in the way that a lot of these why we care people came to feminism by complete accident. I actually was a victim of child sexual assault when I was a kid. And my older sister and I reported it to eight different adults. This was 1971. Uh, and or even earlier in the case of my older sister, upon which nothing at all was done. In fact, there was really almost no law even to protect people like us. I happened to trip just by complete accident over a friend who introduced me to, of all things, the people who had started the first women's studies program in the nation. And they gave me to understand that what had you know, destroyed my childhood uh, was wrong. And that women deserve, you know, better. And that, you know, meant everything to me. So if we go go back to your major thesis on this, you write that uh, we talked about history not being um, a, a point in time, but a continuum. You write that all of us are born into a unique historical moment. The next chapter is yet to be written. What do you see as the seeds for the next chapter? Oh, gosh, the seeds to the next chapter well, we've seen such a resurgence of anti-feminism, right? And uh, groups like the Proud Boys, the founder, Gavin McInnes of the Proud Boys, says that feminists aren't even people, <laughs> and therefore they are punchable. So, you know, speaking of, you know, pushback, <laughs> we're really getting it. So I'm hoping that the next chapter is one in which the 91% of Americans who say in, in, pew, in pew polls that they think gender equality is very important, that that 91% of us will say, hey, this is an American value. We are all feminists in the same way that we are all believers in democracy, despite what Putin and you know Xi Jinping say about Western values or you know, has been. No, this is not has been. We are all united on this, and this is our future together as women and men. And how does the Dobbs decision figure into that, the seeds of the next discussion? Well, that's a very great question. Uh, briefly answered, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a little concerned about the constitutional security of the right uh, to elect to get an abortion, reproductive rights. And of course, what's happening now is that people who are against abortion are also against birth control. So there's attempts to pull back all kinds of rights that American women, by the way, have only had since the 1960s when birth control became legal. So birth control, the legality of birth control and the legality of abortion are, are quite intimately linked. Um, they were both granted in the same basically five, six, seven, eight year time span back in the 60s and early 70s. So that's certainly going to be a fight going ahead, deciding, you know, how can you can you take one person's life and demand that they sacrifice it for another potential person? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Do women have the right to their bodies or not? And at what point does the rights of a fetus supersede the rights of the adult? Can you kill the adult to uh, save the fetus? And of course, that's what people are saying now uh, in a variety of states in America, which is, yes, you may allow the mother to die um, if it means saving the fetus. And so the debate and the development of history goes on. And on that note, we are out of time. Elizabeth Cobb's book is Fearless Women, Feminist Patriots from Abigail Adams to Beyonce. Thanks so much for the hour. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 